they, look, that's my man, Wayman Bugs. Uh, he calls that's... me number 89. And, well, uh, you know, and he might... all my teammates called me Thrill back then. Well, you can call him Thrill. You can call him Renaissance Man. You can call him James. <laughs> you can call him Jimmy. But what you can also <laughs> call him is tonight's guest on Conversations with Commodores. And, man, have we got a good one tonight. James, thank you so much for having some time for us tonight. I am so looking forward to our conversation. Bernard, it's an absolute pleasure, and I am so grateful and honored by the invitation. I've had so many of my teammates and colleagues who've been on, the, uh, on your program, and they all uh, came to me and said, man, you got to contact Bernard and be on his show. And so I heard it several times, but uh, when my dear friend Ed Parrish uh, was on, he called and said, man, you got to do Bernard's show. And so I saw his broadcast and I said, man, let me reach out to Bernard. So uh, on behalf of just Commodore Nation, man, thank you for what you're doing. This is a wonderful activity and it's an opportunity for some guys to really just be able to reflect on some wonderful times in our lives. Well, James, thank you. Right here, bud. Right yes, here. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And we got Oh, speaking of Ed Parrish, Mark Matlock, O.J. Fleming, Dwayne Jones, they're rolling in for the thrill. Man, Matlock, oh, man, that was some fine names to hear, man. Those were my guys, God. Let me give you guys a little bit of background on number 89. And you're right, the thrill is on. Good to see you, says Mark <laughs> Matlock and Ed Parrish. My man, yes, sir. East Nashville High School, 74 to 78 at Vanderbilt, graduated in 79, fine arts degree. Played for coaches Sloan and Pancoast. Had a little bit of a taste with the USFL, with the original Birmingham Stallions. And the redo, by the way, is this Saturday here in Birmingham. With the Stallions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also got to visit and had an audience with Nelson Mandela in 95. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to that. Now lives in Murfreesboro, has got two very talented teenage daughters. If you don't know who this man is, you have not been living and knowing about Vanderbilt football history, about mid-state Tennessee art world and beyond. Let's get after it. Talk about growing up in East Nashville, same high school as Oprah. Oprah Winfrey, man, I'm telling you, Oprah was a senior when I was a ninth grader. And I tell people all the time, had I known, I would offer to carry them books, man, after school every day, you know. But uh, her dad was the neighborhood barber uh, mm -hmm. in East Nashville. And, you know, interestingly enough, Bernard, I grew up in South Nashville in the J.C. Napier public housing community mm -hmm. and then the Edge Hill public housing community. And I had a mother who was determined to keep uh, her children. I was the oldest of six away from any potential trouble or anything like that. So when the neighborhood would start to have a precarious nature, we would move. And so uh, all during the time that I was in South Nashville, I was a straight up scrub. Nobody picked me for their teams or anything like that. So when I got a chance to move to East Nashville, it was almost like getting a fresh start. There was a basketball uh, goal outside of our door. So mm -hmm. I stayed on the court to midnight just practicing to become a better athlete. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I got to East Nashville, they had closed Meg's High School, one of the more fabulous schools in the community at the time. And all the ninth graders went to East High School mm -hmm. for the ninth grade. We had an incredible coach, uh, Ed Eccles, who coached basketball and football. We were unbeaten in both sports city champions in both of those. And so going into each high school, uh, we had some super talented athletes like uh, Ricky Cole, who Ed Parrish got to meet down at Boys State and Floyd Hughes and uh, guys like Nathan Simpson and uh, Ricky Gardner, who recently passed, who was an All-American track athlete at uh, the University of Tennessee. And so uh, still through the 10th grade, I was a little bench warmer. And it just so happened that going into my junior year, uh, Coach Junior Ward, who was our track coach, was coaching the B team. And so uh, Vic Varello had been our high school coach in the 10th grade. And so I remember Coach Varello during the pep rallies at school, he would introduce all these star players, you know, Ricky Cole, quarterback, Nathan Simpson, running back. Then he say, then he would say, James Thrillkill, B-teamer. 
And I was like, Coach, you can just not introduce me if that's what you're going to say, you know. But uh, when Coach Junior Ward, who is still a very beloved coach to former East athlete, was coaching the B team, he gave me a chance to start at wide receiver. Mm -hmm. And Ricky Cole, with his fabulous arms, threw a couple of bombs that I caught for touchdowns. And lo and behold, I became a starter uh, at East High School on the football team, and I was on my way. And then uh, one of my teammates, Winky Beard, got hurt in basketball, and I was thrust into a starting position. So my athletic success didn't really begin until the 11th grade. And so by the time I graduated, I had made All-American in football, All-State, and uh, All-City in basketball, and was a successful track athlete. So I kind of had my pick of uh, degrees. But the one thing that I knew was that I was going to be an artist because my first grade teacher at Napier School contacted my mother and said, Miss um, Thrill Kill, this young man is drawing in class all day. So there's a very good chance that he's going to be an artist. And my mother made sure that I had instruction, materials, and everything else I needed. So there are very fond memories of East Nashville. And a lot of our teammates still get together to do community work. We call ourselves the Unique Gents. And we uh, work with seniors and youth and trying to just uh, improve the community. Uh, where do I start to unpack all of that? That's just, <laughs> thank right. you for sharing a little bit of that, that background. One of the original pioneers says to tell you hello, Taylor Stokes has joined us. Yes, sir, man, a legend among our group, for sure. He sure is, and I'm talking yes, to another sir. one right now. <laughs> James, Going to East High School with so many fine athletes, mm -hmm. so many outstanding sports programs and academic and, and you doing your artwork, we all have our own personal experiences in the high school years. Some mm -hmm. not great, some are memorable. For, for me, which I grew up in South Alabama in, in the 80s, small town, Mm -hmm. My experiences are not the same as your experiences in East Nashville. Did sports allow you or allow the athletes to kind of be across all the, the different parts of the student body societies? Or did you have to stick to just the people in your, your, your uh, teams? Did it allow you to have friendships, I guess is my question, make friendships? maybe uh, help with any race tensions that might have been there. And I don't know that there were or, or were not. I guess what I'm asking is being an athlete and now as 11th and 12th grade being a recognized athlete starring, starting, mm -hmm. did that help, hurt, or have any impact on being a regular student within the student body? Yeah, but no, that's a keen observation. Uh, it definitely played a role in creating uh, the uh, harmony that we experienced at East High School because we were, were not too far removed from uh, East being integrated for the first mm -hmm. time in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. But by the time that our class arrived, um, there was uh, such a degree of interaction between everybody. We had, uh, you know, Black, white, Latino cheerleaders, Mm -hmm. um, the uh, players on the team, guys like Floyd Hughes and Ricky Cole, ran for uh, uh, student offices like president and treasurer and vice president and that kind of thing. And so we were the kind of guys who, even though we played sports, we interacted with everybody in the student body, from the student government meetings to uh, pep rallies and other types of activities and games and those types of things. And so you know, we had great interaction and there was a, a quality among the students that lasts to this day. Uh, Ricky Cole is on the uh, East Alumni uh, Board and students from our class. And we always say that the 1974 class at East High School was the best ever. So uh, we're proud of the accomplishments that we had. But um, our senior year, the entire student body elected an all black slate of officers from president to vice president to treasurer to secretary. And all students had to vote to make that possible. So that was an indication of the kind of relationships that we had established at East. I mean, I remember I was a hall monitor where uh, you had to sit on the hall and make sure students that were 
in the hallway had their passes to be in the hallway. And, you know, every Oprah had a class on the floor that I sat on. But, you know, every day that she came down the hallway, Oprah was surrounded by four or five people, you know, just hanging on to her. And she was nowhere near what she became, but she was just that kind of personality. But she interacted with everybody, you know, and it didn't matter. And so one of the things that a lot of our East alumni are proud of is the way that uh, racial issues did not get in the way of us being able to have an enjoyable uh, experience. Um, our, our track team, you know, was probably 50% black and white divided, but man, we had so much fun. Coach Ward was taking us to Clearwater, Florida for track meets and we go to the beach. And I mean, I still got pictures of all of us standing in the ocean, some of us for the first time. So, you know, that's why the memories at East High School are so fond, uh, you know, among our group. And one thing that uh, is one of the most, you know, profound memories for me, East had a, uh, a very prestigious sports hall of fame mm -hmm. when we were there and it was in the hallway of the gymnasium. And up until the time that we got there, of course, it was all white athletes in that hall of fame. And so you either had to win the Hume Award, which I did, or make all state to qualify for the hall of fame. And so uh, my beloved friend, Ricky Gardner, when he became uh, state champion in track, he qualified for the Hall of Fame and they presented that plaque to him uh, at a pep rally and he became our Jackie Robinson at that moment, you know, uh -huh. and through grace and, and, and blessings, I became the second athlete, black athlete to be inducted into sports Hall of Fame. So, I mean, those kinds of things are just an indication of the kind of environment that he's created back then. And so we are still proud of that red and gray, man. Go Eagles. Oh, just awesome. James, we got Joel Walker, who's a teammate of mine. Mm -hmm. Coach Jeff Madden has just joined the com conversation. The oh, Mad my. Dog, man. What you and talking about? we want about? to congratulate Mad Dog on his prestigious honor and recognition that he just got. Kenny Cole just posted the recognition mm. in the group. So, Mad Dog, congrats to you. Well-deserved. Another National one of my champion, teammates. man. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gerald Collins, one of my teammates, also said he was honored to meet you several years ago when he was a young student. So clearly, well, wow. mm -hmm. you've made an impression, and I know you continue to do so. Guys, I'm talking with James, number 89, Thrill Kill. But Kenny Cole, thank you, bud, for joining in and for posting about Coach Madden. Absolutely. And hello to all those guys. James, let, let me ask you. It's one thing to be a student and keep your studies up in high school. It's another mm -hmm. thing to be an athlete. No matter how talented God has graced you with your gifts, you still got to mm -hmm. work at it. I get it. Mm -hmm. There's only so many hours in a day. When did you find time to continue to cultivate your artistic abilities and, and the, that love? Right. Well, you know, I had uh, parents who stressed discipline for one. So I knew that, uh, you know, keeping my academics up were going to be important. And uh, my mother said to me before I left for Vanderbilt, you know, people are saying you got the potential to go pro and all of these other things, but you cannot never neglect your studies or your art. And so that was ingrained in me from the time I left home. And sure enough, her words became prophetic because during my sophomore year, preseason, I got injured with a very debilitating injury. And it probably uh drastically reduced my chances of you know playing professional sports but uh the first thing i thought about was what my mother said you know do not neglect your art or your studies and so for me um you know i had to go to the coaches and let them know that in the same way that my teammates need books and materials and supplies i have to have paints and brushes and other materials so that i can function in my art related classes but um, one of the things that athletes talk about a lot is that it takes tremendous discipline to go right to practice after class and then spend all of those hours on the practice field, then try to go and get something to eat and still maintain the energy to go home to your dorm room and do your schoolwork. But uh, for me, art was such an integral part of my life at that particular point in time that I couldn't imagine not doing artwork. You know, I set up an easel in my dorm room and painted right there in the middle of my dorm room. And another fascinating thing about me as an artist, uh, 
I was uh, I went to see Star Wars with one of my teammates, Ernest Cecil. And that was the most fascinating film I had seen with the space and all the other things that took place in that movie. So as soon as that movie was over, I came back to my dorm room, went to the art store and got black crepe paper and wallpapered my wall, put aluminum foil on the ceiling and then got a black light and some fluorescent paint and splattered my wall and then painted these posters of Parliament Funkadelic and Dr. J and Shaka Khan and all of these people. I tie dyed a sheet and partitioned off my room and put some of those beads in the middle where you had to come through beads when you came in. When I tell you my dorm room became a show place, I had to run guys out of my room because everybody wanted to come and hang in Thrill's room. But uh, it and, was and, just part and of- I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Ed Parrish confirmed every bit of what you just said. <laughs> Man, I mean, look, Bernard, I had guys who would knock on my door like at 1 a.m. and say, Thrill, my parents are getting ready to leave, but before they travel back to home, could they see your room? <laughs> you know, it was just um, a, a, a reflection of, yes, my passion for art. And then um, the coaches started um, getting me to do the um, scouting report covers uh for games and so to just help motivate the team to get ready for the next opponent so i remember we were getting ready to uh i think play the university of kentucky and we they had taken us to see the movie the outlaw josie wells and there was this scene where uh this guy was asking clint eastwood to hand his guns over backwards and then uh, clint flipped them around and shot the guy so i sectioned off a program cover for the scouting report and in the first clip the Commodore was handing his guns over to the Wildcat, but then in the second section, he flipped them around and shot the Wildcat. And then in the third section, at, after Clint shot that guy, he spit that tobacco on his forehead. And so huh. I had this, this, this Wildcat laying down with some tobacco spit. <laughs> and so I couldn't wait for the team meeting for them covers to be passed out. And just the, the reaction from the players was just, uh, man, just a treasure for the rest of my uh, life. Cause I, they got uh, so, such a kick out of that because they had gone wild watching that movie. But, oh, yeah. you that know, was, I couldn't yeah. imagine not doing art. So mm -hmm. I developed the discipline and I had it back then to always integrate it into whatever I did. Mm -hmm. And, and and once an artist, always an artist. I don't think artists ever retire. It's, yeah, it's, it's a so skill. true. Now I realize it's a skill that comes and goes depending on how many hours and how much dedication you have. Right. But by chance, do you ha still have any of those covers? Those uh, from the, the oh game? Oh my or any gosh! Of those I get I get asked that all the time, yeah. and I wish I had held on to them. You know, uh, there may be somebody out there in Commodore Nation that has some of those program covers, but man, I mean, I did them for the entire season. So there are probably upwards of at least 20 to 30 covers that I did. I mean, when we were getting ready to play an opponent, uh, one time I had the Commodore in the ring as uh, Muhammad Ali knocking out the opponent's mascot. I mean, some teams' mascots took a beating at the hands of my art because oh. I'm telling the Commodore <laughs> Dom. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, one of my next trips to Nashville, maybe this fall for a game, I'm uh -huh. going to find some of those used bookstores in town and I'm going to be on the hunt for yes, some sir, of that man. artwork. You That's never know where it's going to going to turn up. But I want to back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Geographically, how far is East High School, East Nashville, to the campus, to Vanderbilt? Oh, campus? yeah, you're probably talking about a 15 to 20 minute drive at the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and when you, now growing up, clearly Tennessee was a huge impression within your high school. Probably many other schools were. Mm -hmm. How much mm -hmm. on the radar, even though it was across town, was Vanderbilt, either from an academic or an athletic standpoint, was Vanderbilt on the radar? Not just for you, but for the school. Well, Vanderbilt was on the radar because um, we were big fans of Bill Ligon at mm -hmm. Vanderbilt when he was playing basketball. 
And, you know, um, I remember our family growing up, we used to watch the Bill Pace football show on TV and then followed by the Vols program. So um, we were aware of the school, um, you know, watching, um, you know, um, Lester McLean at UT and me being a receiver was just really inspired by what he was doing there and Haskell stand back and those guys. And so, you know, I had a father who loved sports. So um, me and my siblings, man, we just sisters as well, sisters and brothers, we were sports fanatics. And so we were aware of uh, the college teams and the pro teams and all of that. And so um, I never thought that Vanderbilt would be interested because you know, by the 11th grade, I was still kind of a, you know, in my mind, an average football player. But uh, Vanderbilt, when Steve Sloan had came, come on board, uh, his second year, he started recruiting my teammate Floyd Hughes at, Van at East. And they were actually uh, coming over to see Floyd Hughes, you know, uh, a big, agile uh, running back who could play basketball as well and was just a gifted athlete. And so in the process of coming to scout Floyd, I had a pretty good game uh, catching passes against Overton High School in a scrimmage. And so that's how I came to their attention. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that was kind of a new experience for me to be recruited. But going into my senior year, I eventually uh, was recruited by uh, Lee Corso at Indiana University and uh, Notre Dame and Big John married at Tennessee State University. So I had quite a, a recruiting tour and interest from schools, as Ed mentioned, when he went down to Mississippi State and places like that. But, um, you know, I think for me, Coach Sloan and Coach Parcells, as Ed mentioned, were just likable men, you know. And um, I also kind of had this dream of playing locally in front of my family so that they could, you know, come and see me play and not have to travel as far. And so the, the, I guess the thing that pushed it over the top was, as Ed mentioned, when we were invited to the Tennessee All-Star game, there were so many cool guys down there that were going to Vanderbilt. I mean, Ed Parrish, Ricky Jeans, Kimmy Weaver, Dennis Harrison. Uh, I mean, I'm like, man, what a class of athletes that are coming in that freshman class. So got even more excited about the prospects of coming to campus just because of, you know, the quality and the caliber of athletes because those guys, you know, Bill Par Parcells, a Hall of Fame coach, and mm -hmm. Steve Sloan was an excellent coach. So they're only going to recruit the cream of the crop. And so when you look at the players that they recruited and then consider yourself as one of those players, it's quite a compliment. Well, I was going to say, if you've got Tennessee State on your radar as well as Vanderbilt, they're, you know, across town from each other. Mm -hmm. but, but the athletes who you just named, and that's some serious athletic talent, that would have made an impression, I would think, very, very quickly, at least on, on me. But right. Another one of your buddies from back in the day, Jimmy Bronner, sends his love. Says Diamond Jim. Hey, hey, he's a one of a kind dude, man. We just had a great reunion together. But, uh, you know, the other thing about what we were just talking about, Mm -hmm. uh, when we were being recruited, I mean, when we came on campus, we had guys like David Cully and Walter Overton and mm -hmm. Jesse Mathers and guys like that showing us around. So, I mean, you also got excited about the prospects of joining some already super talented Vanderbilt athletes that were already there. Well, that's that's what I was going to also ask you, because until Perry Wallace came on campus, until Taylor mm -hmm. Stokes came on campus, Vanderbilt historically was a pretty lily white student body mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. But by the time you came on in the fall of 74, the number of African American football players was increasing every year. Mm -hmm. And all of the gentlemen that you mentioned earlier coming in with your class, that's a that's a fairly substantial number of African American athletes at one time coming in together. Mm -hmm. Was that was that part of your thought process, or did it not really register that much with you? Know, am I making more of a deal of it than it really was at the time? No, you're not making more of a deal of it. It didn't register with me until the Tennessean newspaper at the time did a headline that said, Vandy signs 10 Blacks. 
Mm-hmm. And the article just talked about how that was the biggest incoming class of African-American athletes in a freshman class. And so, um, you know, for me, I was just excited that, you know, the school was taking a step like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, at 18 years old, man, you're just trying to get out there and get ready to play, you know, and yeah. then uh, just be excited about the fact that some really cool guys are going to be uh, mm-hmm. coming into that same class with you. And to me, an indication of the quality of men that Vandy were recruiting mm-hmm. back then, a lot of us are still in touch with each other some 40 plus years later. Mm-hmm. And we can run into each other and start talking. And it's like, we just have been talking all along. I mean, you, you just you know, hit, James, you just hit on something that I try to talk about in every one of these conversations. Mm-hmm. And I already see the, the wheels spinning in, 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 your, you know, in your mind. When you're a teammate, I don't care what sport it is. I don't care mm-hmm. what age that it is. You see some of those teammates, and it could be just one word or one comment or even a glance that immediately takes you back to a time and place that you all share together. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's, to me, that's the best feeling in the world. Knowing it sure those is. guys And the fact that you've been in touch with them all this time and that you guys get together as often as you do, I think that is just fantastic. And not enough people, whether mm-hmm. you played sports or not, not enough people connect back to their old mm-hmm. friends and times, maybe because they, they just they weren't good times. I don't know. Everybody has their own reasons. Sure, sure. But I want you to take us back maybe to that first year or two at, at Vanderbilt. And I'm kind of weaving two thoughts here at one time. Mm-hmm. How does a man who has developed artistic flair and abilities and putting it on pad and paper and living that lifestyle as an artist, take his wide receiver responsibilities? And do? And I don't know if it's one side of the brain versus the other. Mm-hmm. How do mm-hmm. you weave your artistic side and to know you got to run certain routes or be in certain blocks and those kind of things. Am I, is it too much of a stretch here or did you somehow weave the two together during that time period? No, but no, that's an excellent observation and analogy because uh, I mean, let's get one thing straight. I wear 89 because I thought I was Otis Taylor from the Kansas city chiefs. I mean, he was absolutely my role model as a wide receiver. And so when I played and, I, you know, when I'm doing lectures to students and other audiences about art, uh, many times we hear when school funding is cut, the arts programs are the first things that they want to cut. Mm-hmm. And what I try to emphasize is the fact that art develops your creativity to the point where you take a creative approach to doing science and math and English and any other discipline that you might be interested in. And the same is true with sports, you know, because I felt like I was a creative thinking individual. uh, I ran routes that I felt like were a creative type of process where I was going to make a guy think that I was going one direction and then in a split second, uh, you know, go the other direction on them and be open. And I remember uh, watching uh, legend Paul Warfield uh, who played with the Cleveland Browns, talk about how he beat the bump and run as soon as he got off the line. And he just did these series of fakes that just allowed him to get past that defensive back that was trying to bump him in that process. And, you know, that's why I take issue with that term, um, you know, dumb jock that can be pretty prevalent in our society because, you know, all of my teammates and the guys on this uh, Zoom call were very serious about their schoolwork. And, you know, when they got in classroom, they handled business. business. And, and, you know, I can hear in my ear right now, you know, we'd be uh, out of practice and through eating. And I'd ask Ed a question. Hey, I'd ask your parents a question. Hey, Ed, where are you getting ready to go? Man, I'm getting ready to go study. <laughs> that, was, that was Ed Parrish's catchphrase. Ed was going to study, you know. And it was just inspirational. But, you know, athletes uh, take – Uh, you know, game plans and have to study it and learn from it and that type of thing. And then think of the creativity associated with being 
a, a running back like Frank Mordica or Preston Brown, and you're running uh, downfield at full speed at somebody, and you're already calculating in your mind how to make him think your body is getting ready to do one thing, and when he reacts to it, you break his ankles and go the other way. That is a thought process, mm -hmm. analytical uh, processing in a split second. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't hard to do because I put a level of importance on all of it. I know I got to, you know, work out and stay in shape to be a good athlete. I have to do my schoolwork. And then also I have to devote emphasis to my artwork if I want to be, you know, a, a better artist that continues to work to improve his skill. Mm, all good stuff, guys. I'm talking with James Thrillkill, and we're just running through a whole bunch of stuff tonight. And I want to welcome Ladarius Banks. Darren Rothenberger is with us. Flavius Smith is with us. Flavius. We got all, all kinds of Commodores in the house tonight. Man, my tight end, my, Flavius, my tight end teammate. Man, those are some names. It's a pleasure to hear. Let's talk about being away from football while you're a student. Mm -hmm. Was there a social life on campus? Or did you guys have to go across to other campuses to really have the social life that you wanted? Or did you make your own on campus to a certain degree? It was actually a combination of all of the above. I mean, in the early 70s, uh, aside from the athletic department, Vanderbilt didn't have a lot of uh, Black students on campus. And so there were not a lot of social activities in the campus environment that were, you know, designed to uh, cater to, you know, us as students. I mean, we could go to frat parties and other things like that, but, you know, it was pretty much an all white fraternity environment and that type of thing. But the blessing of it was the fact that um, the football team became its own fraternity. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time why I never pledged a fraternity. I said, football was my fraternity. Mm -hmm. And all of my teammates, black and white, were my brothers. That's how I looked at it. But mm -hmm. for the black students, uh, those students who were on campus who were not um, athletes still formed black student organizations. And we mm -hmm. had a little uh, place called the Afro House where we could go and have parties on campus and that type of thing. And we uh, loved to get together on the weekends and, you know, have parties. The Afro House evolved into the Bishop Joseph Johnson Black Cultural Center, and it's a major resource for all students on campus now. But uh, we just kind of made our own um, circle of friends in that environment. But then also, we would go over to Tennessee State University and hang out over there. And, you know, we had friends over at TSU mm -hmm. who uh, we knew. And then we would also go over to Fish University as well. And something that confirmed my not pledge in a fraternity was when I saw uh, a Vanderbilt student pledge a fraternity and they took him over to Fifth University's campus and they had what I called a soul train line of, pun of punishment. People lined up on two sides and this guy had to walk down the middle of that group and they clobbered the mess out of that guy. <laughs> and so I said to myself, why would I take that kind of punishment to yeah. join a fraternity and then turn around and call this guy my brother? Man, I'm going to still be angry that you beat the mess out of me. You're, you're already <laughs> getting all that punishment on the football right. field. Right. Why, so, why yeah, would you so want I to take said, it off the field? Exactly. So um, I said, no fraternity for me, buddy. It's enough, it's enough to have Ed Parrish cracking down on you on a crack block to take some more punishment like that, man. Oh, that's that's good stuff. <laughs> I want to welcome one of my former teammates, Scott Penny, and also want to welcome Rosie Noble. Thank you, Rosie and Scott. Roosevelt. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Joe, Roosevelt. Joe, Joe Staley has joined the conversation. Awesome. Classic names. Welcome, guys. Roosevelt is the director of the Bishop Johnson Center that I just spoke mm -hmm. of. A and former I'm, former football player doing a phenomenal job over there for the students. And I'm going to put Rosie on the spot. I truly want to get him on this program next month. So, Rosie, if you have time, but let yeah. me know. But, James. It'd be an awesome interview, man. I'm telling you. You are getting them all. You got all kind of love tonight. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so great. I, um, I am so appreciative. I appreciate it. It's a blessing. I want to talk about 
sticking with that social dynamics mm -hmm. of you guys going over to Fisk and TSU. What about the Fisk and TSU students coming over to Vanderbilt to the Afro House or hanging out on campus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they have reservations coming over to a predominantly white campus during that time, or, or was that not a, a concern? Well, you know, I, I can't speak for them in terms of whether they had reservations, but they came. I mean, when we had parties, and, you know, sometimes we had parties in the dorm at Carmichael Towers, but, uh, wait, you wait, know, we had... Parties in Carmichael Towers? I've never heard of those kind of things. Yeah. I'm on, no, I'm, I'm the, James, the I'm kidding. Because I'm kidding, because, I'm kidding because <laughs> every year, we used to call them steroid parties. Rest, you know, anyway, we get back to right. that another time. But I was just kidding with you. But yeah, Carmichael Towers football players and all athletes having parties. Yeah. Carmichael, that was a tradition. Oh, yeah. Man, what you talking about? So, yeah, we knew that we had students coming to campus from um, TSU and Fisk mm -hmm. and Meharry as well. And so, and, you know, we all interacted without any issues or any problems. So, I think, you know, that was just the um, nature of the community back then that we could visit. Uh, you know, everybody's campus pretty much as we chose. Now, uh, I'm not going to say that there were not incidents where some Black students might have came on campus from some other schools and felt like security might have followed them around a little bit more or, or, or things like that. But fortunately, nothing escalated to the point of, you know, something of a serious nature. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, even when I was on campus uh, one time during the summer, I was in summer school and I was <laughs> walking across campus and it's like every time I look back, I notice this guy following me. And then when I turn around, he ducked behind a bush or something. I said, man, if you work for security, you're not doing a very good job because you are not being clandestine at all. So it was kind of funny. But, you know, um, you know, I think that we came from households where our parents talked to us about the potential issues that we could face. And, it, you know, it was just a microcosm of what was going on in society at the time you know there were some scenarios that we had to be careful about and so uh we just kind of you know um kind of took the best approach i mean when you hear stories from perry wallace and taylor stokes in terms of the things that they endured their scenarios were probably worse than ours which made it easier for us who thought our scenarios were tough but we endured them which made it a little easier for the next wave of students that came in. And so, I mean, that's just kind of the responsibility that you take for the time period that you're in a situation like that. What can I do to uh, make sure that those who are coming behind us have a better experience? And I think that's what a lot of the pioneers are committed to doing. How can we make the campus better than when we were there? Mm -hmm. And what kind of things can we put in place to make sure that students uh, know that number one, they deserve to be there and that they're just as welcome as anybody else. And how are you going to yeah. accumulate the skills that are going to help you go out in society and make a difference? And, and you know, each generation, every 10 years or so, they, you could, they, they, just to give you an example, in 88, I was on campus. I was a second, third year player. And that was the class that had Corey Harris and Derek Gregg and all yeah, guys, they call themselves the fellas. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had several of them on my shows at different times, and they have talked about the pioneers. They knew you guys. They know of you. Mm -hmm. guys. They know what you're mm -hmm. doing. Um, and I'm going to get to the pioneers weekend in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But I want to mm -hmm. stick to your time period. I want to welcome Greg Simmons and Gary Clark to the show. Of course, I've got James Thrillkill number 89 we're just running through the 70s right now but James I want to talk about I know that you participated in some protests mm -hmm. on campus. what was that about and why was that meaningful at the time or important mm -hmm. at the time yeah you know I had a classmate who uh, I uh, went with some friends to uh, visit her dorm room to just hang out in between classes and she was playing music by an artist named Gil Scott Heron. And uh, I became fascinated with this gentleman's artistry. And so one of the things he sung about was Johannesburg. 
he had a song called What's the Word? Have you heard about Johannesburg? And so naturally, it piqued my interest to do some research about what he was singing about. And what I found out is about the apartheid that was taking place in South Africa. And so I came a, became enamored with that story and, of course, the plight of Nelson Mandela and a lot of his colleagues. And so uh, this was when uh, Fred Pankos was head coach and we were in practice and Vanderbilt was hosting the Davis Cup tennis tournament at Memorial Gym. And so um, South Africa had a team that had come to play and students from TSU and Fisk and Meharry and some black students from Vanderbilt were out front protesting that Vanderbilt had allowed South Africa to participate. So of course, of course, Coach Pancos told us, uh, guys, you know that protest is going on over there, so I don't want any of you all going over there. So me and my teammate, Mike Mitchell, kind of looked at us and said, yeah, right. You think you're going to keep us away from something that significant? So as soon as we got out of practice, we went over and marched with the students uh, during that protest. And so uh, it was just something that we felt strongly about mm -hmm. and uh, to, you know, just contribute in whatever way we felt like we possibly could was important for us to do uh, because with the atrocities that were taking place in South Africa, um, you know, it just was not um, a, a very appropriate thing to have a nation like that involved in, you know, a sporting event like that. And so, you know, it's kind of ironic because protesting South Africa and then years later ending up going to South Africa was just a pretty serendipitous moment for me. Well, it, it, it was about 20 years later, I think in the mid nineties that you went mm -hmm. and share a little bit about that experience because you had a, a, a very impactful meeting as well as experience from what it sounds like. Absolutely. And again, it was because of my uh, background as an artist. Um, a friend of mine, uh, her name is Gail Hamilton, just talked with her today, interestingly enough, she managed the group Take Six, the acapella phenomenal Grammy Award winning group working for Warner Brothers Records. So uh, Jim Ed Norman, president of Warner Records was um, developing a project where um, artists from America were going to collaborate with South African musicians to put out an album of uh, freedom songs to celebrate South Africa coming out of apartheid. And so um, I had done a painting of Nelson Mandela when he was released from prison in 1990. They had a cover shot of him on the USA Today newspaper with his fist raised. And so, man, I painted that uh, with such pride. Uh, and so five years later, uh, I show this painting to uh, Miss Hamilton and she sends it over to South Africa to their uh, cabinet director for the arts. And they communicated back that that was the best rendition of Mandela that they had seen. And so uh, Gail requested a meeting so that I could discuss with Warner Brothers Records the idea of doing the album cover for this project, but I also wanted to know if I would be interested in traveling to South Africa and to stay for a month doing an art project with students in Soweto, South Africa. I jumped out of my seat, Bernard, when I tell you that I had just dreamed of going to South Africa. And so, when I traveled over there, there was a musician named Victor Masando, still a good friend today, who was going to be playing a concert in Soweto celebrating Mandela returning to Soweto for the first time since becoming president. So he said, James, you will always sit on the stage with me today while I perform. So we're sitting on the stage. Mandela is five rows ahead of me on the front seat. And so this was before digital photography. So I'm shooting up my camera. I'm like, this is the closest I'm going to ever get to Nelson Mandela. So a chair opens up behind Mandela and Ray Peary, who collaborated with Paul Simon on the Graceland project, he was working on the project. He said, James, go up and show Mandela the painting you did of him. I had a photograph of it. So I go up and I tap President Mandela on the shoulder. He turns around and does this, <laughs> doesn't say a word, turns around and does this and then turns back around. I come back to my seat. I said, guys, I done insulted the president of South Africa. So the music stops and he turns to, the, to these two bodyguards the size of Dennis Harrison and they start looking back in the audience and they spot me and start pointing at me. 
like there he is. And so the two of them start coming toward me and I'm like, okay, guys, I probably should say my goodbyes now because I know I'm getting ready to get the South African necktie. So they come and say, the president will see you now. So I go back up there and sit in the chair. Nelson Mandela turns around and says, it would have been rude to talk while the band was playing. So now that they have stopped, I will talk to you. I said, President Mandela, I said, I'm here with some friends from the US. We're doing a, an art project in Soweto. We're going to uh, donate the art to the church where you first started having freedom meetings and then donate the proceeds to the school where these kids are getting access to education. Mm -hmm. So he thanked us for being, for being there. And then uh, he called Gail up and uh, Ray came up and asked for my camera. I said, James, let me take a picture of you and Mandela and Gail. I said, man, I shot my film up 30 minutes ago. <laughs> I was sitting back here. So I have a picture of Mandela, but no record of standing next to him. Ray Perry called me the biggest dummy. He <laughs> said, you big dummy. So it wasn't like I could go in my camera and delete those photos. So yeah, yeah. I said, I don't have the photograph, but that is indelibly embellished in my mind. But mm. Nelson Mandela is one of the most phenomenal men in the history of mankind, and he treats everyone, he treated everyone he met from the servants in his house to the heads of countries with the same level of respect. It was the most phenomenal experience that I could have had as an artist. And uh, the students that we work with, I got to know them for a month to the point where when it was time to leave, man, we could have filled buckets with tears just because of the relationships that we have established. So it was an incredible moment for me. I, I got to ask, what a, what a once in a lifetime experience for you. Did you share this with your first grade teacher who recognized your art skills? Back oh then? my gosh, I would have loved to, but she had long since been deceased. And so uh, I was not able to share it with her, but I always mention her whenever I'm doing presentations in terms mm. of her importance mm. to my development in my art career. And another teacher, my sixth grade teacher, Jackie Thomas, he's still alive. And I always share the experiences of how he impacted my life. Man, nothing is more phenomenal than going back to a teacher and just letting them know the impact that they've had uh, on your life in terms of inspiring you to go forward and do great things. You know, there's not many stories that could top what you just said from a personal experience. I'm mm -hmm. sure. But the only thing I can think of for us to pivot to next is I want you to share about your awesome daughters. I want you to tell us about what they're doing. I have two daughters, uh, Zoe, who's now 15, and Keziah just turned 18, and I'm biting my nails. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, early on, I had exposed them to golf because golf was a game that i looked at as the most boring thing i'd ever seen and would never have played it until charles davis went to the chicago bulls and said that when he was playing with michael jordan jordan used to bug him about going to play golf and he said man i'm gonna go just to shut jordan up so he'll quit asking me to play mm -hmm. and so charles davis came back to town doing the same thing him and wayman bug real let's go play some golf let's go play I said, man, I'm going to go play so y'all will stop asking me to play. Mm -hmm. So I played and just fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'm going to expose my daughters early to golf. And so they started playing, was getting really good. And I'm having these dreams of Richard Williams having mm -hmm. the Venus and Serena of golf. So mm -hmm. as, my, as my youngest daughter continued to grow, she's like 5'11 now, she decided she wanted to switch to volleyball. So she made all tournament as a volleyball player. So I said, okay, I ain't gonna be too devastated because you picked a sport where you're still performing well. But uh, my 18 year old uh, started playing here in Murfreesboro and we moved to Murfreesboro because when they were in middle school, it wasn't a middle school team for them to play on. Mm -hmm. So she has since been the uh, four time MVP golfer for her high school. Wow. And she's already kicking dad's butt out there, which is not saying much, but I mean, she's driving the ball close to 300 yards off the tee already. So 
uh, right now we're kind of entertaining offers from schools to see, you know, who puts the best offer on the table for her to wow. play uh, golf in college. But she was working with uh, Buddy Harston, the golf pro out at Vanderbilt Legends Golf Club, who did a mm -hmm. phenomenal job with uh, mm -hmm. her golf development. And both of them started in the first T program that Tiger Woods was associated with. And mm -hmm. so the um, golf mm -hmm. pro at Smyrna Golf Course, Scott did a great job with them as well. But there was one moment where legendary golfer Lee Elder came to town for a first tee session and I got photos of my daughters posing with that legendary golfer so uh, you know I just feel blessed to uh, have young ladies that you know are showing uh, some uh, excellence in you know academics and sports and it's really a blessing to be able to see that. I know you're equally proud of them because they have chosen sports that are the, the quietest and the loudest from a participatory standpoint. Right. I had a daughter who played volleyball in high school and oh my God, mm -hmm. right. unbelievable. But anyway, that's awesome yeah. to yeah. hear. James, you and I could talk for the next two hours and I would so love to get you back on this show later on to keep talking because mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. not scratched the surface, guys, with this <laughs> man's accomplishments, his experiences, <laughs> and what he has to share. How can folks get in touch with you, whether they're teammates or they just want to connect with you from an art standpoint sure. or sure. just to hang out? How do folks get in touch with you? Yeah, the best way to reach me is by email at thrill, T-H-R-E-A-L 89 at gmail.com, thrill 89 at gmail.com. And then I'm also at uh, at James Thrill Kill Arts on Instagram and James Thrill Kill Art on uh, Facebook. And guys, if you haven't seen James's work, one, shame on you, but two, you are going to be blown away. James, I can't thank you enough for this hour. I have so thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Bernard, it's an absolute pleasure, my friend, and we are just so proud of the work that you're doing to connect Commodore Nation in the way that you're doing, and that's evident in the number of people who joined the call tonight. And so, you know, hello to my guys out there. It means so much that you joined to say hello and uh, anchor down, Commodore Nation. I thank you for the compliment, but I'm throwing it back to you. It ain't about this guy. It's about the <laughs> guest tonight and every night, yes, guys. Sir. Of course, anchor down every every week. Keep coming back. I got all kind of Commodores coming up. Some good stuff. Uh, oh, gosh, this was such a great conversation. James, don't go anywhere after we sign off. I got some things to share with you. You guys okay, have buddy. a safe week, a good week. Remember, Friday is the spring game, 1 o'clock. If you want to go watch practice early or if you want to check in with Coach Lee, let him know you're there. You got to get in touch with Chris Griffin because he runs the Black and Gold Club. He's the connection, and they, they'll print up the name tags for you. And Coach, of course, mm -hmm. wants to see everybody. I can't get out of here without you commenting. And I'm sorry to do this, James. Mm -hmm. Just looking at my notes. You recently, along with about 20 to 25 Pioneers, back in February, attended Pioneers Weekend. How impactful, how meaningful was that weekend for you and, and for the others who attended? Bernard, that was a life-changing experience. And I just have to give kudos to Athletic Director Candace Lee and uh, Chris Griffin and Andrew Moranis and others who worked to put that together. But you had players from the 60s and 70s Mm -hmm. who came together and some of us have not seen each other in 40 years or more. And so the opportunity to just come together, talk about some of our experiences, mm -hmm. shed tears and laughter and grief and a lot of other things was just an important, I would say almost therapeutic session for a lot of the players. And I have to give kudos to my um, colleague, Rod Gurley, who really just continued to push for this type of event to happen, working with Wayman Bugs and me and others. But, you know, legends like Taylor Stokes and uh, Walter Overton and 
to remember a dear colleague like Kimmy Weaver who passed during the 90s and you know to see Dennis Harrison and him uh, bring one of his beautiful daughters to sit at the table with my young girls just to see you know elegance and height to give them confidence to walk tall and be proud but just to share that and so um the um, university also had me to do a painting of a lot of the uh, pioneer players. And so that became a conversation piece as players oh. went up and saw their photos uh, in that. So it was just an incredible long overdue experience and a really important step in trying to just reconnect players with the university who maybe left uh, without the best of feelings, but were able to come back and have discussions about how you can heal some of those feelings and be more engaged with the university. So uh, Candace uh, and her team put a lot of effort into making that happen. And Rod Gurley was very diligent and persistent in uh, stressing the importance of us doing something like that, especially at a time when some of our colleagues were transitioning and how important it was to do that at an important time. But it was just great seeing all of the players who came back for that. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry I didn't get to it earlier in our mm -hmm. conversation. Sure. Absolutely. All right, guys. See you next week. Y'all take care. All right. Thank you.